I thought I was going to speak uh, like 45 minutes to an hour later, so I had this great joke about how we're giving talks on Persian time. <laughs> and, so, and he completely ruined my joke, so. Uh, I think everybody's giving talks on Persian time. Yeah. So. yeah if, you, if you ever show up to a Persian person's house, like when you're invited, the guy will be like brushing his teeth and in a bathrobe. So, <laughs> so I, I felt right at home, and now I'm, I'm sort of set it aside. So I, uh, I am talking uh, about uh, some electrophysiological bar markers for DUP15Q syndrome for the first part of my talk. And at the, the second part of my talk, I'm going to very quickly talk about some new tools we've developed to image network dynamics in uh, freely behaving mice, some open source tools that I hope the basic science crowd could, could take advantage of uh, uh, as they're very much accessible. So this uh, is uh, work that is mainly done by Ben Amandolara, who's an MD-PhD student in the lab in collaboration with Lucia Harley and Chris Lee, um, who are uh, undergraduates or just recently graduates, but in collaboration with Shafali Jesse, who brought me into this whole field uh, uh, based on her really amazing findings that I'll talk about with uh, Joel and Vidya. Uh, and uh, a number of other people from, from Shafali's lab. Um, so I'm very much thankful to be pulled into this, to the field, because it's very exciting to me. So uh, why do we need biomarkers for ASD or DUP15Q or intellectual disability? What, how do biomarkers help you? Uh, so if you can discover a robust biomarker, especially a robust functional biomarker, it, it helps with early detection and diagnosis. Uh, you can use the biomarker if it's, if it's a good one for prognostication. You can follow response to treatments. Uh, you can stratify patients. Maybe a group of patients who have one biomarker signature will respond to a treatment and another won't. Uh, you can give insight to basic biology, and that's where I sort of come in with looking for electrophysiological biomarkers of DUP15Q. So maybe the biomarker tells you something that you didn't know about the basic biology and you can go and dig there and uh, discover, discover what's really going on. You can uh, look for novel treatments and one, one important thing is that we, need, we have a need for convergence uh, in studying ASD. We have, we have a, a large number of genetic causes that are very distinct pathways but the overall phenotype is, is somewhat rather similar so what, where does where do all these pathways converge? And maybe a biomarker, if we can find biomarkers that converge, will help us. And uh, importantly, the, it can create a bridge from human research to animal research. And this is where, uh, where we came in. Uh, so Shafali's lab uh, has done really great work with uh, high-density EEG, and she discovered uh, that there is a very robust increase in beta oscillations in DUP15Q. This is a figure from her recently published paper. Um, and uh, it, this is a sort of jumps out at you. If you look at the EEGs in these, in these kids with DUP15Q, the, the beta oscillation power is much, much higher. And if you quantify this in these, uh, these diagrams, you can clearly see in red that that you know, the power between 12 and 30 hertz is, is greatly increased in DUP15Q. And this is something that was reliable and robust and was seen in almost all the kids. Uh, and so, and if you looked at the density of the increase in these beta oscillations, they were fairly you know, front to temporal mainly, but you could see it everywhere pretty much. So, um, so that's where we came in and, and she said that we see this really robust change, electrophysiological change, and so what is causing this change? Uh, which gene duplication is responsible for it? Is it UBE3A, which is, you know, maternally imprinted of, 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 and a lot of people are going after, or is it the GABA receptor subunits? And the reason we thought about the GABA receptor du duplications is that uh, this increase in beta oscillations is very similar to what happens after you give, you know, benzos to kids or to adults. You get this very dramatic increase in beta oscillations, but none of the kids that actually receive benzos, and uh, and so and these three subunits, alpha five, ga gamma three, and beta three, are duplicated in this syndrome. Could it be that the GABA receptor subunits are responsible? It, could it be other genes, 
or could it be a combination? And uh, could we, if, if we use an animal model and can discover the same oscillation in these animal models, maybe we can figure out where the oscillations are coming from, what the drivers of the oscillations are or the pacemakers. And uh, do, we, can, we could actually go in and test whether these oscillations are actually interfering with cognition. Uh, maybe if they are, then if we got rid of them, uh, we could actually treat some cognitive disability in these kids. You know, attention, working memory, et cetera. Um, so we decided to use animal models, multiple animal models that are out for this uh, disorder. And, uh, and we, we, we've started using one particular animal model, which is the, uh, the Takumi mouse. I call it the Takumi mouse. Uh, Toru doesn't like that. Uh, but uh, so in this, in this model, the entire region is duplicated, and you have paternal and, and maternal. Uh, you can have the, the gene come from the, the paternal side or the maternal side. And if you do that, actually, the results are different. If you have the paternal mice, and these are the mice that gave, you, gave us the gave Toru the, the biggest social behavioral anxiety deficits, memory deficits. If you use that model, uh, UB3A is not overexpressed significantly, but the GABA receptor subunits are. Uh, and so if we think that the oscillations are coming from the GABA receptor subunits, then the paternal DO15Q uh, Takumi mouse should give us the oscillations. Uh, if we look, uh, and the UB3A overexpressing animals should not. However, if UB3A is responsible, then a number of mice that exist now which overexpress UB3A should give us these oscillations if the mouse is actually a good model for this. And uh, the paternal Takumi mouse should not. Uh, so, and maybe it's a combination of all these things and then that will become more clear as we go along. So, what we decided to do is, uh, we, d we were thinking about EEGs, but we've been collaborating with Sotiris Masmanidis. He has these excellent probes, silicon probes that he can, in, uh, you, you can insert really into any brain region in awake behaving animals. We, we, we insert them into head fixed animals and, uh, and we can record from uh, 64 or 128 channels uh, across a large number of brain regions. In this example, we are going to be putting them into the, the parietal cortex, which is, which is, uh, you know, basically somatosensory or somatosensory cortex. Uh, it's an area where, where the oscillations were prevalent in humans. And we wanted to see, can we record these, os this, these oscillations? And so what do the signals look like? So this is, it gives you a very high density recording of local field potentials, which are sort of the sub, you can think of the local field potentials as the local EEG that you can record. It, it's sort of the some synaptic activity that the, uh, that is that this that the cells in that area are receiving. We can also use these recordings not only to look at the local field potentials, but we can we can see individual action potentials from units and sort these action potentials and and look at uh, how specific cells are driving oscillations or being driven by them. And we can insert these electrodes down. And these, this is an example of local field potentials that we're recording from wild type and Do15Q animals. And so we started with the paternal duplication, uh, which is the mouse that, the, that Toru Takumi made and saw a great deal of social behavioral deficits and other deficits. And we don't really see any, any evidence of, of this, these abnormal beta oscillations in these animals. So we have six and three animals. It's a, still a little bit preliminary, but there's, there's not even a hint of, of the oscillation, uh, the beta oscillations. Which one? That was just an illustration. One, one, one. Yeah, one. Oh, this one? Yeah, I'm for, it, it looks a little bit different, but there's no, there's no difference. There's no, there's no difference in the beta power at all. So, yeah, so um, I know we had this discussion yesterday. Mm. So maybe beta power is not what's different in the mouse. Yeah. You know, if you see different, you know, yeah, I'd be happy to find any difference in any <laughs> frequency band, but we unfortunately we're not seeing it. So we, we, these animals are free to run or rest on a treadmill, and we can look at rest and running. And uh, if you look at, I'm sorry, are these the maternal dupes or paternal dupes? These are the paternal dupes. Yeah, 
And so we don't see any differences when the animals are running. We don't see any difference when the animals are resting. And this is just to remind you of what, again, what Shafali saw is that you saw this huge bump in the beta power in the humans. And we don't see anything close to that in our preliminary recordings. And this is the quantification. Uh, nothing is significantly different in the delta, theta, alpha, beta, beta 1, beta 2, and gamma ranges um, during rest or during movement. Did you test the returns? I mean, That's what we're doing next. We did people, right, in the original paper. We yes. We saw maternals and paternals with the EEG pattern. Mm -hmm. So it's not so cut and dry. Yeah. We already have data from people, right, that says that it's not just yeah. Just to be clear. Yeah, we, we're going to do that next. That's, that's our plan. So it could, it could end up being maternals and not maternals and wouldn't survive. Yeah, and, and it could be also copy not. Well, we'll talk about it. So I looked at beta delta ratios. Yeah. I looked at, uh, we looked at beta delta ratios, and we, we don't see any difference in that either. We, we decided to look at other brain regions, including uh, prefrontal cortex, where we inserted the electrodes. We don't see any difference in beta power in prefrontal cortex. Uh, these are small numbers, but there isn't even a hint of a difference. So, so to just conclude this section, uh, before I go to the miniature microscopes, at this moment, we don't see any difference in beta power in the paternal uh, Do15Q mice. And so this, there, the paternal do 50 mouse has a, an overexpression of GABA receptors. It's not a severe overexpression, maybe 30, 40 percent, if I'm right, from your paper. Is that, is that right? 50 percent? Uh, but no overexpression of UB3A. And so maybe GABA receptor overexpression at this level is, is not enough to induce these beta oscillations. Uh, maybe we're looking in animals that are a little bit too old because when we looked at the the kids, the kids had higher beta power than, the, than sort of the older. These animals are about four months old. Uh, so we could go younger. We could test the maternal Dupe15Q animals. Uh, we could increase the dosage. Um, and uh, we would like to also look at all the other UB3A overexpressing uh, animals to see if we see it there. And so um, just to end this section, I wanted to acknowledge, I acknowledged everyone at the beginning, but I also I wanted to acknowledge Satirs Masmanidis, who makes these very cool silicon probes that, that generate a huge amount of data that we're just beginning to analyze. Some of the other undergraduates that worked on the project, Ashley, Yin, and Lili Lin, and then uh, Toru, Ben, uh, Matt Anderson, and Scott, who've given us uh, mice, and we're very much appreciative for that, and my funding sources. But I'm going to move on. Let's see. Just to give you guys another taste of what other things we're working on in the lab as far as tool generation. So this is sort of what, it, when we did these recordings, this is sort of what it looks like, except there was no virtual reality. And the reason I'm showing this virtual reality is to show that you know, it's, it's difficult to do realistic recordings in head-fixed animals. The electrophysiological recordings are much, much easier if the animal is head fixed. You can use the same electrode, record from a large number of animals. There's, it, it's, it's, it's far easier, but working in head fixed animals, is, we do a lot of other imaging, like two photon imaging, and, um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's difficult, especially if you want to look at social behavior, if you want to look at the traditional tasks. So um, there were these miniature microscopes developed at Stanford. Uh, by Mark Schnitzer's lab that were commercialized, they were extremely expensive, they were about $150,000 to buy a couple of tiny little microscopes. You can use these miniaturized microscopes in freely behaving animals to do calcium imaging. And, uh, and my, with, in collaboration with Alcino Silva, Baljeet Kock, and uh, Dejan Markovic, we decided to build our own miniature microscopes and op open source them. And uh, this was done mainly by Daniel Aroni in collaboration with Tristan Schumann and Denise Kai, who are at Mount Sinai now. They're, they're assistant professors there. Uh, and Daniel is now an assistant professor at UCLA, but he was a postdoc in my lab. And so these little miniature, you can imagine taking your big fluorescent microscope that many people use in their labs, epifluorescent microscopes, shrinking them down, and then putting them on the head of the animal. And so 
instead of a big objective, you have a tiny grin lens and you have little filters uh, instead of your sort of filter set. And instead of your camera uh, that you may put on top of your microscope, you have a little cell phone camera. And so this is what it looks like. The animals are freely behaving and you can do calcium imaging which reports the activity patterns of a, 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 here in the hippocampus like six, seven hundred cells. Uh, the cool thing is you can look at the same cells over many days to weeks so you can get an idea of network dynamics. We're going to be using these in, in the Takumi mouse and in the other Duke15Q model mice uh, to look to see how uh, these changes affect the way uh, corte uh, co the cortex and hippocampus work in freely behaving animals. And so this is an example of, sorry, I won't play. Oh, there it is. And so here's, for example, if, if we look at the hippocampus, the hippocampus has a lot of cells which code for space, and we want to know how these internal maps for space uh, these cognitive maps are affected. We can use these microscopes, and this is an example of six cells that are recorded that code for a particular location along a linear track. And so these animals are running, and we can look at look at where these cells are active at uh, at different places. And you can see they clearly code for different locations along the track. These are the cells that are telling the animals where they are. And uh, and you can see for in a two-dimensional area, th this is the activity of one specific cell that's active in a corner of the field. So it would be important to look at how these cells uh, are, are activated in specific locations to see how and how stable these activity patterns are. You can look at activity across multiple days to even a month. You can look at the same cells. And we, we've used this not in the Do15Q model, but we, in a model of epilepsy, which is the pilocarpine model, and looked at how place is coded in the hippocampus. In this model, uh, the animals have a prolonged seizure, and then they have spontaneous seizures as they grow older, um, very frequent seizures. The place fields in these animals, which code for, for space, are much broader. And importantly, the stability of these place fields across days is completely gone in the epileptic animal. And this could be one of the main reasons that, that cognition is changed in these animals, that this, this, the, it's the stability of the representation for space is gone. And so we are building a lot of new microscopes, which a lot of people may be interested in. Uh, the one thing that I'm going to talk about, uh, we have like wireless or two-channel microscopes, optogenetics-capable microscopes, and microscopes combining like electrophysiology and imaging, and a lightweight microscope. But the the one we've made most progress with is a wireless microscope, and so this saves all the data on the head of the animal. There's no wires. Uh, a little micro SD card goes on top of it, and we can get about 20 minutes uh, in mice. Um, in bigger animals, we can record for much longer. For example, in big bats, we can record probably for an hour or two, and in monkeys, probably for several hours. It's all limited by the weight of the battery. And so here's an example of our wireless microscope. It works quite well. This is a social behavior task, and, and we can do calcium imaging just like we did in, with the wired animal. It's, the lacking a wire is a good thing, especially here, this is some an example from social behavior showing that a wire, just having a wire may actually disrupt social behavior a little bit. So, uh, and you may, for example, want to do behaviors that are very unusual. You may have animals running in tunnels or, you know, be involved in aggression type behavior where a wire would, wouldn't necessarily be the best thing. My friend wants to put them on bats and have the bats fly for, for, for uh, around the room. You can't really have a wire. And so the, the, the one proof of principle experiment we did was on a very long track, which actually mice walk across long distances. And here we have the animals. We call this the marathon track. And so you can see it goes all the way down there and then he comes all the way back. And so we can do these experiments. We couldn't do them if, they, if we had a wire. And uh, we share all, all the, the, the directions on how to make the microscopes. Our microscopes are very inexpensive. You can build them for about $1,000. You, 
You could buy the ones you wanted to buy for $150,000. Toru knows he bought the expensive ones. <laughs> he has buyer's regret. Uh, but you can build ours for $1,000, and uh, we teach classes on how to build them and use them. We have workshops three times a year. We have a website, miniscope.org, where so I, I thought only a few people would be interested, but uh, uh, 300 labs are building our microscopes, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. You can see all the people that have logged in to our website. Even there's like a person in Siberia is logged in. We think that's a hacker, actually. Probably yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, it's, uh, we, th we think they're Russian hackers, and so we're, we're taking precautions. Uh, <laughs> And so these are our workshops, and uh, we have about three a year, 20 people come and learn how to use the microscopes and how to analyze the data. And uh, we wanted to thank my collaborators and all our funding sources with this as well. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>